Allen Lund Company, 47 years young and a proud sponsor, wishes OOIDA all the best as you celebrate 50 years. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. Every day, truckers across the country get scanned emails, texts, and even letters by snail mail. However, some of the communications truckers receive are very real and need to be attended to. That was the case recently with the state that was informing truckers about a tax they needed to pay. I'll discuss the real stuff, the scams, and more with Joe Biggs and Aaron Lynch of OOIDA's Business Services Department. Eventually, every trucker will face an inspection at roadside. How you react to that and what you do next can have a huge impact on your operation. David Grimes and the folks at CDL Legal help a lot of truckers with situations like that. I talked with David recently about inspections. And finally, a decrease in load volume and truck post has registered on the DAT load board. Landline Now's Ashley Blackford has the details on this week's market update. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today. A recently formed task force dedicated to snuffing out predatory leasing practices will hold its second meeting next month. The members of the Truck Leasing Task Force will meet virtually on October 17th. The first meeting set the stage for what the group hopes to accomplish. The second meeting will focus on the types of common truck leasing agreements available to drivers. The task force's goals include evaluating the effects of commercial motor vehicle lease arrangements and discussing best practices for future agreements. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg spoke with the landline shortly after the first meeting and explained this is all about making sure people aren't being taken advantage of, which by extension keeps drivers in the industry, which by extension makes our roadways safer. If you look at the number of drivers who leave their job every year, uh, that alone is enough to cover the uh, uh, the gap we have right now between the number of truckers, uh, truck drivers who are operating and the number our country really needs. So, of course, we got to do recruiting. We've got to encourage people and, and make it easier for people to take up this career. But that's just a leaky bucket if we're not in, making sure that this is a job that people want to stay in, uh, both because that's how we're going to keep our numbers of, of, of drivers consistent with what America needs. And because, as you mentioned, we know that experienced drivers are the safest drivers. And so it's a safety win every time you keep a good experienced driver on the road. But in order to get after that, that means we've, we've got to tackle the issues that are affecting quality of life. The task force includes nine industry representatives. One of them is Jim Jefferson of OIDA's Business Services Department. At the end of its work, the task force will provide recommendations to FMCSA. A new report makes the case for electrifying the U.S. trucking fleet. Adiona Tech's report titled Connected Thinking U.S. argues that large trucks need to be electrified before passenger vehicles. Adiona provides a wealth of stats to back up that claim. Most center around emissions. For one, Adiona states that combination trucks make up 1% of vehicles on the road, but are responsible for 18% of vehicle emissions. According to Adiona, the average fuel consumption of a combination truck is 20 times higher than a typical passenger vehicle. The report says moving just five combination trucks to greener technology would be as beneficial as 100 households buying an electric vehicle. The owner-operator Independent Drivers Association has an opposing stance on where electric vehicles should go first. OIDA President Todd Spencer told Landline that passenger vehicles, not large trucks, should be the first fleet to go electric. He said that electric vehicles cannot operate without an infrastructure grid that supports charging stations, and without charging stations, no EV of any size is practical or workable. Spencer said automobiles and light trucks would be the logical first place to start. The Truck Parking Safety Improvement Act in the House has another co-sponsor. Representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina is the latest Democrat to sign on, bringing the total number of co-sponsors from both sides of the political aisle to 37. Reintroduced earlier this year by Representative Mike Bost of Illinois, H.R. 2367 would allocate $755 million over a three-year period toward truck parking projects nationwide. A companion bill in the Senate, which also has bipartisan support, has nine co-sponsors. To contact your lawmaker and help get this issue over the finish line, check out fightingfortruckers.com. 
If you're in the trucking industry and have issues with autonomous trucks, brokers, compensation, ELDs, fuel prices, speed limiters, or anything else, really, the American Transportation Research Institute wants to hear from you. ATRI is accepting input for its 2023 Top Industry Issues Survey for a couple more days. The annual survey asked trucking industry stakeholders to rank their top issues of concern for the industry, along with potential strategies for addressing each issue. Dan Murray, ATRI's senior vice president, said the results have led to positive changes in past years. He also noted that while the survey provides a blueprint for carriers about what concerns are out there, it's also something policymakers take note of. Well, one of the things, and I apologize to any public sector listeners, of course, is our friends in government, local, state, federal, they don't understand trucking. They don't understand supply chains. You know, they don't want the trucks on the road, but they sure want their uh, e-commerce package delivered, you know, tomorrow morning, maybe even this afternoon. So they're involved in a lot of urban planning. They're making a lot of decisions about roads, rest stops, um, even zoning. You know, they'll, they'll zone truck parking out of urban areas, and yet they want their store uh, shelf stock. So I am always advocating to get this report, Top Industry Issues Report, into the hands of government folks, because knowledge is power. The more they understand the role of trucking, truck drivers, and, and goods movement, I think the more sympathetic they'll be to some of our needs. And when we hand them the top industry issues list and say, this is what the industry needs, and a lot of things on this list could be resolved by government policies and investment, then I think they'll listen. Truck parking was the biggest concern among commercial truck drivers last year on the survey, followed by fuel prices and driver compensation. The deadline to take part is Friday, September 29th. Check out truckingresearch.org for more info. The results of the 2023 survey will be released on October 14th of this year. The price floor has been set for the sale of Yellow's terminals. A federal bankruptcy court has approved Estes Express Line's $1.5 billion offer. It's a stocking horse bid, meaning that total is the lowest amount Yellow's 169 terminals can sell for at auction in November. A higher offer is possible, though. Estes previously outbid Old Dominion by $250 million. A separate auction of Yellow's trucks, trailers, and other equipment is on the books for October 18th. Police in Arlington, Texas, need some help from the trucking industry to solve a recent hit-and-run crash that killed a police officer. The incident happened around 6 a.m. on Thursday, September 21st on westbound I-20, just east of the St. Augustine exit. Police say Officer Darren McMichael was driving his police motorcycle when he fell into the road after bumping into the back of an SUV. An unknown dark-colored sedan then ran over him and continued westbound on I-20 without stopping. Police are asking that any truck drivers in the area of I-20 between Highway 175 and I-45 on the morning of September 21st check their dash cam footage and provide any information they may have regarding this incident. There is currently a $20,000 reward for an arrest. McMichael had been with the Arlington Police for 24 years and was a member of its motorcycle unit for the past 13. And finally, a technical school in Tennessee that specializes in training medical students is branching out to driver training. Compassionate Care Technical Center in Knoxville has added a three-week program that includes training on all kinds of trucks. It's also the only school in Tennessee that offers flatbed training. Courses also are available for those with a current CDL who need additional training or a particular endorsement or certification. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Congratulations to Tony Smith of Indianapolis. He's received the OOIDA Safe Driving Award for 28 years of safe, accident-free driving. That's the equivalent of a car driver going 210 years without causing a single accident. Next, I'll discuss Arkansas's ad valorem tax and more with Joe Biggs and Aaron Lynch of OOIDA. And we'll hear some advice about inspections from David Grimes of CDL Legal. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Firestone tires are for more of everything. More miles for every tire dollar and more confidence in your fleet. At Firestone, we help fleet save with dependable value. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com dealer. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. 
For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Loadboard Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Loadboard Pro. Landline Now, welcome back. Every day, truckers call OOIDA with problems they're encountering out on the road, looking for advice on how to handle those situations. And many of those truckers end up talking with OOIDA's Business Services Department. Here to discuss some recent problems and what the possible solutions are, are Aaron Lynch and Joe Biggs of Business Services. Guys, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having us, Mark. Always good to be back. Thanks for having us, Mark. Let's start with Arkansas. It's a state that has a huge population of truckers. A lot of people travel there. A lot of people are based there. Um, and they've been their public service commission has been sending letters to carriers about the ad valorem tax. And I think the first thing that we have to deal with is what in the heck is the ad valorem tax? The ad valorem tax is essentially a use tax. Um, it, it's slightly it's slightly different than like New York, Oregon, all them, um, whereas it goes by the mileage that you run as well as the value of your equipment. It's it's more of a property tax assessment type deal. And what are these letters saying? Uh, typically, they you know get your information from from maybe like IFTA and see that you've been running in the state. Um, towards more outside carriers, and they say that, you know, hey, you know, this is the tax that we have in place. You need to respond to us and file a report for it. Um, and they'll send them out, and sometimes you don't run in the state, and they'll send one out. You still need to respond, and typically they'll send two different letters, and you need to respond to both, letting them know, no, I do not run in the state to avoid any fees or penalties or anything of that nature. So they can assess you a penalty even if you don't run in the state? Correct. Correct. I have not heard of anybody actually receiving a penalty, but they, they claim they can, yes. So how do you tell what is a real letter and what might be a scam? Because this sounds like something that is just ripe for scammers. That that one's kind of a hard one. Um, once again, you'd be looking at like on the bottom, is, is it a fine print deal where they say they're not actually affiliated with the state? It, it, it'd it be kind of hard to tell. But if, if you do end up receiving one and you're not sure, always reach out to us, send it in and let us look at it. And we'll be happy to help you out. Okay. And folks, if you do need to reach out, the phone number is 816 816- Two two nine five seven nine one again eight one six two two nine five seven nine one. Do we know how much their ad valorem tax runs? I, I, you mentioned that it varies by by mileage and value of the equipment, but do we have any idea on a range of that? I currently do not. Um, like I said, it's it's based off of the miles you run and the value of your equipment. What their property tax rate is, I am not sure. Okay. Well, let's go on to another topic here. How do I contest a roadside inspection? What are some of the reasons people are wanting to contest these inspections? Well, some of these inspections have, frankly, wrong violations on them, um, you know, or they're, or they're deemed the, a different carrier, things of that nature. Basically, what it comes down to is the data queue system. Basically, the data queue system is in place. It's all done online. Keep that in mind to where you get a copy of that inspection report and you can contest each violation that's either on there or you can contest a crash as well. And you're petitioning that state essentially to explain what happened, why it isn't your inspection or why isn't your violation or why isn't your crash. There's many different things to where you can test on there, can, can, can contest on there. Um, you want to make sure that you're very clear. It gives you a box that you can write about a paragraph to explain your story. Um, it has the inspection report, driver name, all that information where you're seeing it, whether it's your portal, safer. Uh, you have the inspection report in your hand, whatever the case is. That way you can actually explain your side of the story. Because essentially, there could be an uh, – you look on safer and there's an inspection that – doesn't belong to your truck or trailer. The the plate or the VINs don't even match up. So it could be a DOT officer fat-fingered a number or something like that. It could be that simple. And that violation goes on your report, and you're wanting to check it on a monthly basis. You want to make sure that everything is attached that you have in place every single time. And keep in mind, you want to get this report 
these inspections reports. You want to make sure when you're actually getting them on the roadside, you get a copy of them. So many times there's people that don't actually get a copy of their own inspection report, which sounds crazy to me, but it does happen. So you want to make sure you're able to see exactly what's going on. Where do you check online? I mean, you mentioned the data queue is online, but where do you check uh, your inspections online so that you can check and see if, for example, somebody has put one on there that's not even for your truck? The easiest way is to check your portal account with your DOT number and your PIN. You can also check it on Safer. It's public. Um, but you can see, obviously, a little bit more. You can see the driver name, uh, a vast history as far as that goes on the portal account. Now, there was a problem with data queue challenges uh, back in the day that sometimes that these data queue challenges were went back and they were uh, decided on by the officer that initially did the inspection. Is that still a problem with this system? It's still a problem with this system. The system is inherently flawed. Um, it's, it's good and it's a work in progress, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's not – it's – it needs to be non-biased. It needs to be a third party or a system in place where you have a council making these decisions because so many times it's not necessarily going back to the officer, but it's going back to their superiors. And how many times are they going to take your side over the officer's side? Who works for them. Correct. Yeah. It's inherently biased. Do you have any recourse in a situation like that? No, because there's there's no other way you can petition. You have to petition that state. I mean, you can ask to speak with someone specifically, but it's so hard to get someone on the phone. It, it, it's it's almost impossible to. In some states, it's a lot easier than others, but you can. Whoever responds to your data queue challenge itself, there's so many times where they're not even answering the phone if you have a legitimate question, and there's no time frame attached to it either. You know, they can. I've had a data queue come back the same day. I've also had to wait six months for it. A good rule of thumb is two weeks, but there's nothing once it goes past that two week period from stopping it. You know, I've had one fall through the cracks even, and I had to call an outside source from FMCSA to make something happen. Just a mess. It can be, in my experience. Okay. Well, let's talk about something positive because a lot of this stuff is, is kind of negative. But uh, we had someone call in asking what apps or tools can help with the back office of the business. What sort of areas are these where truckers are needing help? I mean, what part of the back office operation are they looking for help with? Typically, you know, file keeping, stuff of that nature. We actually have a couple on our website that, that you can go to the discounts and rebates uh, page and look at. Um, it helps with, you know, different things, freight tracking, invoicing, helping you maintain, you know, your compliance records, your maintenance records, uh, stuff of that nature. That's typically what they're looking for because, you know, especially when you're new, it, it's all coming at you. When you've been in it and you've done it a while and you, you know what you're looking at, it gets easier. But they need help understanding what that information is and keeping track. Of it. Are there areas where it's best to do it yourself? I, I would say if if you have a working knowledge of, you know, of organization, honestly, you should always try and do it yourself. You want to know what you're doing and you don't really want to have to pay someone else to do it for you. Now, there are tools and, and systems and, and companies in place that can help you out with this stuff, but I, I would recommend at least attempting to do it yourself first. Okay. What do you want to avoid in terms of back office services? I mean, are there some of these folks that uh, maybe you don't want to go to or that you don't want to use for some of this? Honestly, no. We don't really hear a lot about services like this um, not being beneficial. Now, there may be some dispatch services that say they do back-end stuff for you, and it just may not be a good deal for you. Um, but uh, but as far as you know, some some certain companies that can help you maintain all your files and keep in compliance, we, you don't really hear a lot of negatives. Now it's going to cost you some money, of course, but they do what they're supposed to. Okay. Uh, another issue here: some law enforcement agencies are now cold calling new entrant carriers to prepare them for their audits. Now this is uh, this is something that just seems to me rife with possibilities for problems. Let's start with what agencies are doing this. I mean, who is it that's actually doing these calls? So I haven't personally heard of these agencies making these calls, but 
if they in fact are, you're going to want to verify these agencies. So get their information and tell them you'll call them back. I would call FMCSA. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be DOT or FMCSA who's reaching out as far as that goes, if these are the agencies, in fact. And all their information is public as well. So get the information, get an email, get a phone number, get a name, um, the agency they're working with, if they have a badge number, things of that nature, and then tell them you'll call them back and reach back out to them. Call FMCSA, call the DOT, or call us and one way or another, we'll get down to the bottom of it, and you want to verify who that person is before you're giving out any of your valuable information. So don't respond on the phone, and, and I would I would think you'd want to go to the phone number, say, on the FMCSA website. Correct. Rather than one that they give you. Correct. There's field offices. They are hard to get a hold of, but th- I would stress wait as long as you can on the phone. It's worth it. Because these may be legitimate. I just haven't heard of them myself. Okay. Um, On the legit calls, what should a carrier have ready for new entrance safety audits? I mean, what paperwork, what other information? Typically, you're, they're, uh, for the new entrant audit at least, they're typically looking for one driver, information on one driver, of course, 30 days of consecutive logs with one interstate trip, um, MVR, CDL, med card, uh, records for your drug consortium, your insurance, your signed MCS 90. Um, they're looking for basic information to, to, to show that to show them that you are doing what is what is you know required of you and keeping track of the information. And, and keep in mind, don't wait on getting all this this paperwork together. Don't wait until they reach out by email or phone call or, or something like that. Get all this stuff together right when a driver gets hired or you get your authority set up. Get it together within the first couple of weeks. Now, are there services that can help you out with organizing this paperwork? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, our, we actually have our compliance connection that can they can assist with um, back office stuff, making sure your driver files are ready, um, expirations on permits and stuff like that we can help with, which may not necessarily be asked of for these on, this new entrant audit, but it's just an additional thing they help with. Um, they can always, on your behalf, reach out to our CMCI if they have a signed waiver uh, to get your drug and alcohol records, get it packaged to you, sent it over to you. That way, all you have to do is send it on to them. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to get to one other thing here, and that is broker tracking, uh, requiring carriers to allow tracking on their cell phones. Um, and this is this is leading to some other problems. Uh, brokers calling them in the middle of their 10-hour break, waking them up, asking for their location, available hours, and all this. Why are brokers doing this, first of all? They'll claim that's what the shipper wants, and that may that may be true. They, they they may want that information, but they also want to just you know have 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 their finger on you at all time. I feel, and they want to know everything you're doing at every time. And even if they're not looking at it, they're going to call you and see what you're doing, get an update. Um, and if you choose not to, they may not work with you. They may fine you every load you run for them. It, it it's kind of a rough spot. Um, and it leaves you little choice because there's no laws in place to say that, no, they can't track you. I mean, you're doing your interstate commerce. You know, if, if, that, if that's their requirement, they can ask you to do so. Um, that said, I mean, calling you in the middle of the break, what should you do if they start doing that kind of thing? There's not really a whole lot you can do because um, actually in 395.2, I believe, they have um, – uh, interpretations that discuss short communication, such as a short phone call, text message, emails, and how it does not actually interrupt your 10-hour break. Now, it may be hard for you to go back to sleep, and I think there is issues there, but technically what they're not what they're doing is not illegal, um, and there's not a lot you can do except for maybe try and stay away from them if, you, if possible. Okay. Well, guys, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you both very much for all the information. Thank you as always, Mark. Good to be here. Okay, I've been talking with Joe Biggs and Aaron Lynch of OOIDA's Business Services Department. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. For catness accuracy, weigh your truck on a cat scale. When you weigh on a cat scale, you get a no excuses guarantee. You can now save time weighing by using your smartphone. Find out more at weighmytruck.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. 
That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Eventually, every trucker will face an inspection at roadside. How you react to that and what you do next can have a huge impact on your operation. You're listening to Landline Now, and I'm your host, Mark Reddit. Welcome back to the program. Inspections come in several different types, each one a little more thorough than the last. And some inspectors are determined, once they get a truck at roadside, to find something. David Grimes and the folks with CDL Legal help a lot of truckers with situations like that. And I talked with David recently about inspections. First of all, I'm wondering if we can go over what are the various types of DOT inspections. I know we've got level one, level two, and so on. Can you go over the basic types of inspections that people are likely to face out on the road? Yes. Um, so the you're right. There's levels one, two, and three are the common ones. Um, and they sort of, um, you can kind of view them in, in uh, the, like through the analogy of depth. Um, so level three is the highest. If you're starting for the top, um, that's only going to be a driver uh, inspection. So um, the officer will ask to look at your logs. He'll ask to look at some of your paperwork. Uh, the next level down uh, is going to be a little bit deeper. He's going to go over a few things. And then a level one inspection will be a thorough fine tooth comb uh, look at everything having to do with the truck. Uh, he'll probably get up underneath the truck and look through things. Um, he's really going to uh, be extremely thorough. So uh, those are sort of the, the main three levels that a driver will see. And there's a couple of other uh, unique situations with oversized loads, hazmat. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the details of each of those, uh, but just know that there are some other unique cases that will happen. Another um, unique case is actually what's called a post-crash inspection. Uh, and that can be um, any of the levels, but what makes it unique is that, well, it's post-crash and an officer is looking at different things that uh, have maybe been affected by the crash. And he's recording everything as he normally would in a violation section on an inspection report, but he'll mark specifically what things he thinks are post-crash and what are pre-crash. Anything that's marked post-crash on an inspection report actually does not count against a carrier's safety score. Uh, so if a carrier is really worried, oh my goodness, my driver got in a crash, he rolled the truck, there's going to be so much damage, and all of that's going to go on my safety score. Well, anything that's marked post-crash will actually not be uh, added to that score, even though it is recorded on the inspection report. You know, that kind of uh, raises a question in my mind is when you've got a truck that's damaged like that, how would he tell what was pre-crash and what was post-crash? That is a very good question. We um, often get requests for a data queue challenge, which is how you can uh, make challenges against something that is listed on an inspection report. Uh, so to correct the data and possibly improve your score. We get a lot of those requests for post-crash challenges specifically related to logbook violations. So a common scenario is a driver gets into a crash. Um, unfortunately, they may have to be um, uh, carried out on an ambulance or something like that, uh, or somehow are uh, otherwise unable to get back into the truck and uh, sort of shut everything down properly. So the ELD will keep picking over showing that they are on duty, possibly that they're driving even. Um, it'll lock into a status, whatever was the last thing, and especially if it's sustained damage and doesn't know to, to shift off. Um, and then, of course, the, the DOT officer will come back in and see, oh, my goodness, there's like the, the driver has gone over the 11-hour limit. Well, uh, maybe the last hour of that was, uh, you know, sitting on the side of the road upside down. Um, so... Uh, we do see that frequently, and it is something that uh, you should review those post-crash inspections very carefully to see if there's something like that, that a officer will say, no, this was pre-crash. And you're like, mm -mm, no, that was definitely post-crash. That should not go on my score. Um, let's get back to the reports on these. Obviously, these inspections produce reports. What sort of information um, is on those reports? What are you uh, going to see on there that's important to you as a driver? So you'll see a lot of different things. Um, there's a ton of information on inspection reports. 
and they will look different depending on what state you're in. The DOT uh, in each state kind of has a standard template. It changes a little bit from state to state, but most of what you'll see, uh, and, and really the most important information, is going to be uh, who the carrier is, who the driver is, um, when the report was given, uh, and uh, especially the violation section. Uh, that's usually sort of in the middle of the report, like physically on the page, and it'll list any uh, particular things that the officer who was doing the inspection thinks are wrong with either the driver or the the uh, truck. And uh, anything that he uh, thinks is wrong with that will go on to a record in the DOT. And it'll often be uh, adding points to the carrier's safety score, uh, which will sort of add up in a really particular way uh, that we've talked about before. And um, that will uh, just sort of add into their, their full score there. Okay. When you're looking at them, uh, what are you looking for? How do you read these reports as someone who's not done the inspection themselves, obviously, mm -hmm. but but how do you look for what you need to know off that report? So when I'm looking at a uh, an inspection report, uh, technically, we're, we're, okay, I'm sorry, we're calling them inspection reports. Um, their, their technical name is driver vehicle examination report. Um, so if there's some confusion there, that, that is what they're listed at the top. Um, and the first thing that I'm looking at is the violation section, um, because what I want to know there is, is there something that I can challenge um, against the record on that is currently on the driver and on the carrier? Uh, is there something I can do to improve um, the record that's been impacted by this inspection report? Um, now, a lot of things that I will see there that are really helpful immediately are, was the driver given a ticket or not? Uh, that will be listed in the violation section. Uh, was the driver put out of service? Is this a post-crash violation? Um, and uh, there are certain, uh, this is definitely some, some in the weeds uh, sort of DOT shenaniganry, but um, is the a violation code something that is points or no points, um, because there are sort of basic violations that an officer can write um, that he knows will be miscellaneous. They won't be any points against the driver or uh, the carrier. And um, those can be set in place really of any other violation code. If the officer knows that something is weird or unusual enough to not try to tie it to points. Once you've got this report, once you've read it, once you've seen what you're looking for, um, what do you do with that information? What is your next step? So um, if, if I'm a driver and I'm taking a look at a, a report, uh, one of the first things I, I will want to know is, am I being put out of service by anything? The officer will, uh, of course, tell you if you're being put out of service. Um, and is it something that I can fix quickly? Um, being out of service is very expensive. It's quite costly um, because that load that you were uh, making good steam on and, and bring it to your destination, suddenly that stopped in its tracks for whatever reason. And um, there's no way of getting it to its destination and getting that uh, closed and paid until um, you can deal with whatever issue it is. So is this something that's going to put me out of service? Is this something that I can fix quickly? Um, so my my teammate Alex um, had told me before we started uh, a little very important piece of information that um, the you'll see trucks driving around with um, a, a sticker that says CBSA um, and what that is for for drivers who are not aware is that a um, a driver who has successfully passed a, a driver vehicle examination without any violations uh, can ask for one of these stickers. And even if you do get something that puts you out of service and you fix it immediately, you can still ask the officer, hey, can I have a CVSA sticker? It's not a get out of jail free card, but it is something that visually shows the next officer at the next inspection point, hey, this driver recently got passed by another officer um, because they do have a, a um, uh, a certain time limit on the, the CVSA stickers that'll show like when they are dated. Um, so the next officer will see, hey, um, it looks like another officer cleared this guy. I've got four trucks in a row. 
I think maybe I'll let the CVSA sticker guy pass and I'll go and take a, a more thorough look at the next truck. So again, it's not a get out of jail free card. It's nothing that's particularly official, but it's a, just a little sign to show that uh, you've passed through an inspection and that you can be considered a uh, safe driver who's in compliance. So that raises kind of a question. I'm sure that some folks out there are asking themselves um, if the CVSA sticker, as you said, it's not a get out of jail free card, but obviously it does have some effect on the next inspector down the line. Is that something you would want to ask for if you are stopped? Do you want to get an inspection to try and get that sticker? Or uh, what advice would you give people in that case? That's a really good question. So um, a lot of people ask if... Uh, I should go and just go and get a, a safety inspection really quick. Um, if I know that everything in my truck and everything in my logs and paperwork is good, can I just get a clean inspection on my record? How will that help me? Um, one is that, yes, you could get a CBSA sticker that will help you, especially if you're planning on taking a long trip afterwards and don't want to go through the rigmarole of getting stopped over and over and over again. Um, another is that um, a... Uh, clean inspection on a carrier's safety score and on a driver's um, will sort of help offset uh, any inspection records there that have violations listed on them. Um, it's not a one-for-one -one balance, um, so it's not you know uh, an angel on one shoulder and a, a demon on the other or anything like that, but um, it definitely will help uh, sort of soften the the visual uh, on those violations. Uh, if someone's looking at your record and sees, oh, I see that you got, you know, four inspections. Well, they were, you know, one with a violation, one without, one with a violation, one without. Okay. That looks way better to me than two inspections back to back with violations. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Is there anything else in this topic that you think people need to be aware of or that they need to keep in mind? Yes. So oftentimes drivers will find themselves in uh, a way station um, with a lot of other trucks and a lot of drivers, they are uh, being looked over uh, one after the other, being pulled aside uh, for different inspections. Um, there can be a lot of activity going on all at once. Um, DOT officers are only human. and They are fallible as the rest of us. And even though they are trained um, to look through the details and be really precise, um, they make mistakes. And so something that is really important to do uh, when you are looking at an inspection report that an officer has given you is um, make sure that the information there is accurate and not just the violations, but uh, the driver name listed, a uh, co-driver listed, the carrier listed there. Uh, we see numerous examples uh, brought to us of a driver who gets an inspection, brings it to his carrier, and the carrier sends it to us confused. This is not me. This is not my driver. Well, why did my driver get this? Well possibly just because the DOT officer was in a rush. And this was truck number four of 20. And he really had to get through it and just made a mistake. Um, so if you don't see that, uh, no one is going to be as thorough in checking your record as you. Um, so if you don't see that, then uh, it'll just go on your record and, and be affecting you in a way that it shouldn't. Um, always good to double check um, when, when an officer hands you one of these. I've been talking with David Grimes of CDL Legal, a legal services provider for the trucking industry, about DOT inspections and how to handle them. You can learn more by calling CDL Legal at 913-738-4836 or by going to their website, cdllegal.com. Again, that phone number is 913-738-4836, and their website is cdllegal.com. And you can find all that information on our website, landlinenow.com. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. 
Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. There are a number of critical questions you need to answer in order to run a successful trucking business. Among the most important of those questions are, where's the freight going to be and how much is it going to pay? Today, Landline Now senior correspondent Ashley Blackford will bring us answers to both of those important questions with a look at this week's freight markets with the folks from DAT. Here's Ashley Now with the report. Thanks, Mark. And hello once again to Robert Rouse with DAT. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great, Ashley. Thanks for asking. What trends emerged in the spot market over the past week? Yeah, last week, um, you know, we after the week prior where we had a little bit of an increase um, last week, we actually saw a 10 percent decrease in load volumes uh, that brought the loads down to just over one point two, three, five million loads. Um, we're still seeing lower load volumes than 2019. Um, but the good news is, is that we're within a couple of percentage points of that load volume. Um, and if that if we stay close to that 2019, we should see, start to see a good, nice pickup in loads in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, when we look at the number of trucks on the DAT load board, they also decreased by about 2%, um, down to 375,000 trucks. Um, even though we've seen carriers leaving the market, this is still the second highest number of available trucks in the last seven years um, for this week. So it's still very strong truck market, um, even though there's some carriers still leaving the market. When we look at the overall strength of the spot market last week, um, we did see load to truck ratios decrease for vans and reefers for the second week in a row um, with only flatbeds seeing a slight increase. Kind of drilling down into reefers, load post volumes have decreased about 30% in the last month and has been flat since July 4th break uh, following last week's 21% decrease week over week. Um, typically we see an increase in load post volume over that time frame. Um, but the USDA reported loosening capacity in some key growing regions in the Pacific Northwest and California. And it's a, actually a 16% year over year increase in truckload capacity in those regions, um, accounting for just over half of the current national volume. Uh, there was also a surplus of trucks reported for loads and imported from Mexico in Southern Texas, although the same uh, was reported that, that about this time last year. So nothing out of the ordinary with that. Um, but with carrier equipment posts decreasing by 4% week over week, that resulted in last week's reefer load to truck ratio decreasing slightly from 3.72 to 3.05. Uh, and lastly, when we think about rates and seeing how they are, last week we talked a little bit about how they were nearing the bottom. Um, but la you know, one of the things we looked at is the national broker to carrier spot rates without fuel actually decreased across all three equipment types um, with only flatbeds seeing a little bit of a bump just because of we added we added fuel back in when we look at the rate averages over the last six weeks they've been pretty consistent but last week they were actually below their six week average um, which means we're still searching for that bottom of the market during our discussion last week we covered a few uh, produce markets which markets and commodities should carriers focus on this week yeah, well, one market to, to call out that I think is really interesting. Um, if you're driving through the Lehigh Valley, um, which was all manufacturing plants and farmlands about 20 years ago, it's kind of a different landscape today with all the distribution centers feeding online shoppers across the Northeast. Um, not for everybody, but given the terrain, tolls, traffics, but the loads pay well when retail goods are in high demand. Um, and that is going to happen in the holiday season. So Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley win encompasses uh, the DAT's Allentown network. It's becoming the East Coast uh, version of the California's Inland Empire, um, which is where we see lots of loads being moved. Um, about 30% of American consumers are within a day's drive 
of that specific region. And the market is about 60 miles from Philadelphia, 90 miles from New York, and less than 200 miles from Washington, D.C. So some of the top manufacturers in the area include Mack Trucks, Lutron Electrics, Electronics, and even um, Bebron Medical. Um, when we look at kind of why that, that market is seeming to grow, real estate market analyst CBRE called Lehigh Valley the fastest growing industrial real estate market in the entire U.S. Um, this makes sense because it's a great place to distribute goods to a large amount of people really quickly, um, which has become consumers' expectations to get goods almost overnight a lot of times. When we look at the van postings out of Allentown last week, they went over a hundred different markets all around the country, but the bulk of them were split between Elizabeth, New Jersey and Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so it still makes it a great opportunity for carriers to, to get some good loads coming out of that region. Um, now, diesel's down just slightly, um, according to EIA. How do you think that will impact uh, the market? Yeah, I think that really is a good, it's good sign, you know, seeing it go down uh, last week. Um, but don't be too excited. We There's still a good chance that that continues to rise. Um, we still see Saudi Arabia and Russia both reducing their production quotas for the, till the end of the year. Um, so it's good because it was kind of peaking a little bit. So it might flatten out a little bit. The good news for carriers is, is if it kind of continues to go down a little bit, that will help give some breathing room. Um, but it's something that we are going to have to continue to watch for to make sure that it's moving in the right direction. One of the constant topics discussed this year has been fraud and double brokering. With in increased scrutiny into uh, doing business with new relationships, what resources should carriers be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in any business environment, your online presence is extremely important to manage. Um, there are a lot of tools that are being developed to help quickly vet new business relationships to reduce fraud and bad behavior. Um, and a lot of those look specifically at carriers. Um, one of the first steps is to closely monitor what reporting agencies are saying about your company and, it, and any load providers you use. Um, so a good resource is the DAT directory, as it has the latest information about every carrier, broker, shipper on DAT's network. Um, and we draw from government and commercial sources. And it can help users really validate a company's contact information, operating authority, uh, publicly available safety data, and insurance information. Um, so you can actually get down in the weeds and make sure that they've been around for a long time. Um, it also has reviews of brokers and carriers. Um, and you can always write reviews and request reviews and make them a part of a strategy to market your services and make yourself stand out. Um, here are kind of three simple ways to use reviews to your advantage. One is uh, give good reviews. Um, generosity and goodwill are just good business. If a broker does a good job, let others know about that positive review. This is a subtle tactic, but other brokers will notice your support and will gravitate toward people we know and think fondly of us. And, you know, that's a great way to help other carriers and everybody know this is a legit broker that you like doing business with. Um, the other thing is, is ask for a review. If giving reviews is a long game, asking for reviews uh, gives a more immediate gratification. Um, doing so after you've written a review for a broker entices them to return the favor. Um, it does have to be, doesn't have to be elaborate. Um, just say, hey, if, if you like our company, please uh, leave us a review on DAT. Um, again, that can help legitimize your specific carrier company. The more positive reviews you have will help you say, hey, this is a legit carrier. We can see they've done business with a lot of other brokers on the DAT network. Lastly, um, you know, do good work. You have, you have to give good reviews and you can ask for good reviews, but none of it matters unless you're delivering quality service. Um, treating customers and partners with respect, keeping your word and living up to the standards you hold others to is the most effective way to receive positive reviews. Um, you know, doing all that and having a plan is super crucial. Um, you can always learn more about DAT.com forward slash directory. When you search for a broker, just click read all reviews. And while you're there, Check to make sure your information is up to date. It's really the first step in managing your online reputation. If our listeners want more information, where can they go for that? Yeah, you can get the latest rate information at DAT.com forward slash trendlines or look for the weekly market updates on the DAT blog. They're published every Wednesday. Uh, or check out and subscribe to the DAT IQ channel on YouTube where our analytics and forecasting teams take a deep dive into the freight markets each week. All right. Awesome. Robert, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ashley. 
That was Robert Rouse with DAT. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Ashley. That's our program for today. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mark Redding, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.